So I'm here to tell you that one of the most powerful healing modalities in the world is not found in the pharmacist's counter, is not found in the jungles of Peru, and is not being prescribed by doctors. It's found in the dreaming mind, and specifically in the dreaming mind into which you bring conscious lucid awareness. Because once you bring lucid awareness into the dreaming mind, you have access to one of the most powerful virtual reality simulations in existence. A virtual reality simulation so powerful in its healing potential that cultures around the world across millennia have used it to heal the mind, heal the body, prepare for death, and engage spiritual practice while they sleep. My job over the next hour or so is to offer you this argument, this idea, this concept through a series of stories, case studies, and scientific research to prove to you how powerful lucid dreaming is. So by the time you leave here in an hour, you know why you'd want a lucid dream, and crucially, you want to learn how to do it. And if you do want to learn how to do it, then I've got a workshop uh, later on today. <laughs> or you can do the quest. Who here's done the Mind Valley quest with me? Anyone? Oh, okay, cool. It's pretty good. It is pretty good. I, I think it is a very good lucid dreaming course, not just because of me, but because of the way Mind Valley present their stuff. Uh, so you can check out the quest to and teach yourself to lucid dream. This talk will not be instructional. It will be enlightening, I hope, telling you about how lucid dreaming works and why you would want to do it. So uh, we're going to begin with the basics. So what is lucid dreaming? Who's got a nice definition for me of what a lucid dream is? This is the interactive bit. Yes. Being awake in a dream, yeah, so being in the dream and knowing that you're dreaming. Any advance on that? Can we expand on that? Knowing that you're dreaming as you're dreaming, what then? Yes. Nice, yeah, having control over your dreams or influence, being able to change the dream while you're in it. So a lucid dream by definition is any dream where in the dream you go, oh, wow, I'm dreaming. So if you need to ask me, was that a lucid dream or was it not? It probably wasn't. Once you have a lucid dream, you will know. For most people, their first few lucid dreams go like this. Dream, 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 dream. You see a dead grandmother or you're back at school. Something weird happens. You go, what? That can't be real. I'm dreaming. Oh, my God. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. Boom. And then you wake up in bed. Has anyone ever had that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So a lot of my job is teaching people how to stay cool so they can stay in the dream for longer. But, yeah, if you have a lucid dream, you're probably going to know about it. Um, for those who maybe haven't had a lucid dream or don't think they've had a lucid dream, has anybody here ever had a nightmare where in the nightmare you've gone, I've got to wake up, I've got to wake up? Anyone ever had that? Okay, that was a lucid dream. The moment you acknowledged there was a place to wake up to, you had indirectly acknowledged, hey, I must be dreaming. So here's the first takeaway. If you are ever lucky enough to find yourself lucid in a nightmare again, don't wake up. Stay in the nightmare for as long as you can. Why do our nightmares recur? Why don't our happy dreams recur? Why don't that dream where I'm having a dinner date with that movie star, Tom Hardy, why did I only have that once? I've got a crazy man crush on Tom Hardy. I always have these dreams that he's like my best mate. But why did I only have that dream once or twice? Because in the moment, that dream was already integrated. It was a happy dream. I liked it. There was no need to have it again. But a nightmare, if you cut a nightmare short, by waking up from it, or the nightmare waking you up from it, you necessarily have to have that nightmare again. Why? Because it is a therapy session cut short. The nightmare is your internal therapist. A nightmare is a sign of a healing mind. If you are having nightmares, you are not unspiritual, you are not pathologized, there's nothing wrong with you. It's a sign that your mind is doing what it is supposed to do, heal itself. But we have pathologized nightmares. Think of how we use the term nightmare. Oh, it's a fucking nightmare, this journey. You know, we use it in that way. We think that nightmares are wrong when in fact nightmares are like dragons guarding a pot of gold. And we don't want to slay the dragon. We want to befriend it. If you slay the dragon, yes, you get the pot of gold and you stop having nightmares. But if you befriend the dragon, you still get the pot of gold, and you've got a freaking dragon <laughs> to ride about and to harness all that energy, all that power. 
So we know what a lucid dream is. It's any dream where you know that you're dreaming as the dream is happening, whether it's a nightmarish dream or a happy dream or a sexy dream, whatever it is, right? How does it feel? You know in like Hollywood movies when they show dream sequences and they put on the dry ice, the smoke, and they got a soft focus and they're like, wow, man, he's dreaming. That is not how lucid dreaming looks or feels. If you wanted to show how a lucid dream looks, you'd go from normal definition camera work to boom, full 4K HD. Because once you're lucid, it is realer than real. Lucid dreaming is an experience of hyper-reality. And that is not hyperbole. Think about it. Right now, your experience of reality is being mediated and limited by the five sense organs being filtered through the sixth, the mind. Some of you are wearing glasses. Perhaps some of you have a perforated eardrum like me. Perhaps as you get older, you notice your taste becomes slightly less. So we know that our experience of reality right now is limited. It is not full reality. But in a lucid dream, those limits are removed. People often say in the lucid dream, wow, I could see every tiny blade of grass in that dream. I could smell everything as I walked through that garden. I could taste everything when I bit into that apple. Why? Because you're not seeing through your eyes in a lucid dream. You're seeing through your mind. You're not tasting through your olfactory senses. You're tasting through your mind. You're not touching through the touch pads. You're touching through your mind. It is an experience of hyper-reality. And this is why when we engage healing, trauma integration, or work with phobias in the lucid dream, the healing is so deep. Because it is such a profound reality into which we're engaging that healing. Of course, this is why lucid dreaming sex is so seductive. Because in a lucid dream, you're not having an orgasm, you're having a mindgasm. First two years of my lucid dream experience, 16 to 18, purely on sex and skateboarding. And I got really good at skateboarding, so maybe that neural pathway thing that we'll learn about later is true. But yeah, it can be addictive, that. Then luckily I got into Buddhism a couple of years later. I ended up living in a Buddhist temple for seven years. And they have this thing called dream yoga, which is like the spiritual practice of lucid dreaming. And I started training with these monks and Tibetan lamas. And I said to them, you know, I can lucid dream. And they said, really? Wow, when we do the monks training, when we do the four-year retreat, we, we train ourselves to lucid dream. And the monk said to me, so what do you do in your lucid dreams? <laughs> it's like skateboarding mainly. <laughs> I was so embarrassed, so I say to the monk, you know, well, well what do you do? Why, why are you guys lucid dreaming then? And he goes, oh, we lucid dream to do our spiritual practice in our sleep. We lucid dream to heal and integrate trauma and psychological distress. We lucid dream for the moment of death. And it was like, boom. This penny drop moment. And from then on, I started really lucid dreaming. And getting to this stage now, where I'm promoting lucid dreaming purely for psychological growth and healing. And it is incredibly powerful. In a lucid dream, you are conscious within the unconscious. Conscious within the unconscious. Now, if that sounds a little bit like hypnotherapy, it should. And if I only had 30 seconds left with you, if I had the elevator pitch to give, I would say this. Anything you can treat through hypnotherapy, you can also treat through lucid dreaming. In the same way as a hypnotherapist will take a strand of the conscious mind down into the subconscious and plant a seed of healing intent, so too in the lucid dream do you take a strand of the conscious mind, but not just into the subconscious, but into the depths of the unconscious, right to the bottom of the iceberg, simply because you can't get more unconscious than asleep. So the depth to which you go in a lucid dream is far deeper than any other modality. It does not mean that things like hypnotherapy, shamanic journey, and yoga nidra, psychedelics, dance work, aren't great. They're brilliant and way more accessible than lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming takes a bit of effort. But once you do have a lucid dream and you engage lucid dream healing, it seems to be very, very powerful. And only one lucid dream is required. Most of the case studies I'm going to share today are people who healed themselves in one lucid dream. Now, it may have taken weeks or months of the practice to get to the stage where they could become lucid. But once they did, one lucid dream was all that was needed. One of the cool aspects of lucid dreaming as well is this idea of lucid living. You know, when you have a lucid dream, 
Oh, well, let's look at non-lucid dreams first of all. Every night when you go to sleep and you have no your normal non-lucid dreams, you are being duped by an illusory hallucination that is so realistic you believe it to be real. Think about it. You think your dreams are real while you're in them. If you didn't, you'd be lucid. It's only when you wake up in the morning and you go, the alarm goes off and you go, oh, well, I'm not really the Queen of England. I'm Charlie dreaming I was the Queen of England, right? <laughs> And that was a real dream. I had this little pink hat on um, and a matching pink dress. So every night when we go to sleep, we are lost in illusion. We have a very strong habit of believing our internally generated hallucinations to be real. When you start lucid dreaming, you engage a powerful deconditioning process that says, ah, no more am I duped by the illusory hallucinations of my mind. Now I have woken up to them and gone, oh, it looks like reality, but it's not. I'm dreaming. This is all a hallucination. This is all my mind. If you have enough of those experiences, it starts to affect your waking state. If you have enough lucid dreams, you start to become lucid in the waking state. And full lucidity would be enlightenment. When I talk about lucid living here, I'm talking about waking up in the same way that the Buddha talked about it. Waking up from what to what? Waking up from the illusion of separateness? Waking up to the reality of oneness? Every time you lucid dream, you are training a new muscle that says, I see through illusion. I am no longer duped by the bullshit of my mind. And that'll change your life. But isn't it just all woo-woo? Just sounds like bullshit, doesn't it, really? Like, oh, come on, you can get lucid in the waking state, and you can heal your mind and all this kind of stuff. It's a good question. And in fact, there's, um, is my friend, I've forgotten your name, but there is a female German engineer who I spoke to two days ago. Is she in the, in the audience? Yes. What's your name? Marai. So we had a wonderful discussion outside, and uh, Marai was wonderfully skeptical about lucid dreams. Basically, like, I think it's all bullshit. We had a really nice conversation, and I think I won her over by the end. She turned up to the talk anyway. All right, this next slide is for you. Because I was thinking, oh, Mind Valley audience, they're so open-minded, no one's going to really care about the science stuff. And then I realized, no, there are loads of people who care about the science, so I'd better cover it. Okay. Lucid dreaming is for real. Please, if you don't believe it, take a photo of this. You can Google them. I'm not here to convince you. In 1975, lucid dreaming was first scientifically verified at Hull University in the UK. Before that, lucid dreaming was known to be a subjective phenomena, but there had never been objective uh, scientific study of lucid dreaming. But 1975, we got it. Then 1980, Stanford University did the first EEG study, so looking at the brain waves of people, and they were like, yeah, lucid dreaming's for real. You can see the brain waves change. Frankfurt University in 2009, and then finally, 2012, Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry, they did the first lucid dreaming study using fMRI, which is like a live image of the brain. And what they, what they managed to do was get to someone to fall asleep inside a brain scanner. And they were a, a profound lucid dreamer, a proficient lucid dreamer. They fell asleep inside the brain scan and had a lucid dream. So for the first time ever, you could see exactly what brain networks light up when you become lucid. And it was amazing what they found. When you are in a non-lucid dream, so your average all everyday dreams, the back part of the brain, the brain stem, the occipital lobe, the visual cortex, highly active. The front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, where the scientists say your sense of self your sense of agency, your sense of I am having an experience lives, is almost entirely switched off. Now that explains why we can have such crazy dreams. You know, we dream we're a child if we're an adult, or we dream like we're, a, we're friends with celebrities and stuff like that. It's because your sense of self is almost entirely switched off, or at least very flexible in the dream state. And of course it's switched off because you don't know you're dreaming. There isn't a sense of agency, there isn't a sense of will, right? Once this person became lucid, they saw the prefrontal cortex, boom, light up like a Christmas tree. And they said, well, that makes complete sense, because now the person knows that they are dreaming. Their sense of self is back online. Their sense of volition, their sense of agency is back online. So that was the first amazing uh, finding they found. But the real kicker was this. 
neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity describes the phenomena of the brain that can rewire itself in favor of a newly learned skill or repeated action. The classic thing from Joe Dispenza is neurons that fire together, wire together, right? So the more you use certain brain networks, the deeper the grooves become in the gray and white matter of the brain, and the easier it is then to engage that practice and to learn. It's like the kind of neurobiological basis of learning and habit. Non-lucid dreams, no neuroplasticity. Lucid dreams, once the prefrontal cortex switches on, neuroplasticity is engaged, meaning that whatever you do in the lucid dream state is affecting the physical neurology of your brain. If you have a lucid dream, sorry, if you have a non-lucid dream that you're practicing your martial arts all night, the next day you might wake up and feel, oh, I really want to practice martial arts because I dreamt about it all night. But you're not actually going to be any better at martial arts. It doesn't work that way. However, if you become lucid in your dream, oh, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. What do I want to do? I'm going to practice my martial arts. And then you spend the lucid dream practicing your martial arts. Scientific studies have shown you will get better at your martial arts in the waking state. The next day, they can test you, and you will have improved in martial arts. How do I know this? Because I was part of that study. <laughs> and it's quite embarrassing. 25 martial artists, and I was the like, lucid dream teacher, right? So they were expecting great things from me. They checked how good we were at this certain kick sequence in the waking state. Then we had to go into the lucid dream and practice the same kick sequence. Then the next day, certain tests and stuff, they see, did you get any better? Of the 25 participants, 81.3% got better at martial arts by training in the lucid dream. That's fucking nuts. 81.3% got better at training in the lucid dream. The reason I share this study was because, embarrassingly, I was one of the 19 or 11%, whatever, that didn't get better at, lucid, <laughs> at, uh, at martial arts. Got better at lucid dreaming, but not at the martial arts. So this is real. They did another study on squats, Heidelberg University, three months to teach a group of German athletes to lucid dream. After three months of learning to lucid dream, and you can use your lucid dreaming to meet God. You can use it to integrate your post-traumatic stress disorder. You can use it to transform childhood trauma. But they were only allowed to do one thing in the lucid dream, squats. <laughs> how freaking boring is that? And they checked how many squats could they do in the waking state. Then they trained in the lucid dream. They checked how many squats they could do afterwards. They all hit their personal best. That's nuts. Their legs weren't moving. They were asleep. <clears throat> This is what a lucid dreamer looks like. <laughs> you know, lucid dreaming is not happening in the hypnagogic state. It's not a shamanic journey. It's not an out-of-body experience. You're asleep. You're like snoring. You're out for the count. But internally, in this huge, again, virtual reality simulation of your own psychology, you can change the wiring of your brain. As I came out on the stage and said, lucid dreaming is one of the most powerful trauma integration treatments in existence. Why? Because of what we've just said, neuroplasticity. Once the prefrontal cortex switches on, as it does when you become lucid, as far as the brain is concerned, you're awake. Now, this is kind of a scary philosophical point for anyone who's, who might have thought about simulation theory or might have thought that perhaps we're all just brains sitting in, in glass tanks in someone's laboratory somewhere. As far as the brain is concerned, wakefulness is not predicated by having your eyes open. Wakefulness is predicated by prefrontal cortex activation. Once the prefrontal cortex switches on, as far as the brain is concerned, you're awake. This means that lucid dreaming about doing something is not like imagining it, not like dreaming about it. It's not having a hypnosis session about it. It's like you're actually doing it. Which is why if you integrate a trauma, if you face a fear, if you work with a limiting self-belief, as far as the brain is concerned, you actually did that. Let's use a little example to start with. Anyone here scared of spiders? Yeah, I used to be, until I used this technique. I mean, you throw a spider at me now, I'm getting out of the way. But I could pick it up and take it off the stage. There was no way I could have done that a few years back. Let's say you're scared of spiders. 
In the lucid dream state, you could intentionally work with your fear of spiders. How? Don't, as one student did, go into the lucid dream and go, spiders, now! <laughs> everything turned into spiders. He was like, the walls turned into spiders, the sh my shoes turned into spiders, everything became spiders. But isn't that cool how the lucid dream responds? You're in your imagination. Thought manifests as form. Thought manifests as form. So don't call out for spiders, but what you could do is, oh, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. And with full lucidity, you can think about the past, you can consider the future. If you get lucid tonight, you can go, whoa, this is so cool, I'm actually in a lucid dream now, I can tell Charlie about this tomorrow, this is so cool, I'm going to put it on the Tribe um, app. You know, you can think about the future, you can consider the past, and you are very much in the present. So you could be lucid and go, all right, I want to explore my fear of spiders. And then you could imagine that, you know, behind that screen, there's going to be a small, friendly spider. Start small. Imagine if there was a spider here, how cool that would be. Ah, there isn't, but let's imagine. I could pick this spider up. Now, remember how realistic lucid dreaming feels. So be aware, you're going to feel everything. You're going to feel its little hairy legs. You're going to feel it crawling up. But you know, the spider doesn't exist. My arm doesn't exist. None of this exists. I'm asleep in bed. This is all a three-dimensional projection of my own mind. And with that, I can be fearless. I can let the spider crawl up. I can hold it in my hand. I can kiss the spider. And as far as the brain is concerned, you're not dreaming that. You're doing that. So the brain goes, well, for 38 years, I've been scared of spiders. But right now, I'm holding one fearlessly. So, oh, we'd better make a new neural pathway for that because we've never had one before, and we know the easiest way to make new neural pathways, novel activity, like new activity, the first time you've done something. So it's going to need to lay down a new neural pathway saying, I'm not scared of spiders anymore. And the really cool thing is, you don't need to believe this. You can check it the next day. If you want to know, has a kind of trauma integration worked or a work, working with phobia worked, the next day, we know that your startle response towards spiders will be lessened. We can check it in the lab. So you don't need to believe this. There's no guru to worship. There's no faith to have anything in. This is science. It's just a science not many people know about yet. And my job, my mission, is that when I shuttle off this mortal coil, people will know about it and that lucid dreaming will be fully accepted into mainstream science, therapy, and psychotherapy. <laughs> so this is the real kicker here, right? This is how the trauma integration is working. Neural pathways are laid down in the, dream, in the lucid dream just as they are when we're awake. So trauma integration, while lucid, becomes hardwired into the brain. Now, as many of you know, I've spent the last seven years, a lot of my work has been with military veterans. Uh, some from Afghanistan and Iraq. i uh, worked with older uh, people from Vietnam. Uh, and actually, some people from conflicts they're not even allowed to talk about. And a lot of these people have very bad nightmares from what they did or what they didn't do, or what they saw, or what they let happen. If you're having a recurring nightmare that you are back in Iraq and you're under fire, when you wake up, the body is still in a shock response because the nightmare feels so real. However, if you can train yourself to become lucid in that nightmare and know, whoa, this is just a dream. I'm not really back in Iraq. I'm dreaming I'm back in Iraq. And because this is a dream, I don't need to be afraid anymore. I can either change the outcome with superpowers, or even better, I can walk fearlessly into that hail of bullets, knowing there is nothing to kill me and no bullets to exist. If you do that, the brain doesn't think you imagined doing it. The brain thinks last night you went back to Iraq, and you had a very similar experience to the one that traumatized you, but this time you changed the outcome, or you had no fear of what was happening. The last slide I'm going to show you today is a study I did at the Institute of Noetic Sciences exactly one year ago. It came up on my Facebook thing of the one year ago memories. And we were able to shift people out of clinical post-traumatic stress disorder within one week, learning lucid dreaming. The study gets published this month, 
And when the study gets published, there will be noise about it. Because the results are so shocking, the scientists had to triple check them. And once they found what the results were, we instantly got another £150,000 to do another research grant on it, starting in January. Thank you. Oh, so here's the first time I've advertised that. If you are currently struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder or trauma, and you want to be part of the next study, it's totally free, uh, and go on my, it'll be advertised soon, and it's in January of next year. There will be a control group and a real study group. Even the control group, if you're in it, will make sure that you do get the workshop as well, so that everybody is equal. OK, so that's the neuroscience of lucid dreaming. What about the spiritual science of lucid dreaming? So I lived in a Buddhist center for almost eight years. And it turns out that within multiple spiritual traditions, lucid dreaming is a powerful tool that has been used for thousands of years for the same things, trauma integration, spiritual practice, preparation for death, anything you can treat through hypnosis, all that kind of stuff. But they haven't got science on it. They've got the internal science of the mind. You find lucid dreaming within Sufism, within Tibetan Buddhism, within Toltec Mexica shamanism of Mexico, and perhaps within early Christianity, perhaps. The evidence is not that high on that, but there's, there's, a, there's a perhaps there. Within Tibetan Buddhism, it's believed that once you become lucid, you have seven times the power of consciousness. 700% more power in your consciousness is achieved once you become lucid. So if you ask a Tibetan Buddhist Lama, why am I able to heal myself from my lucid dream? Why does it only take one lucid dream for my PTSD to be integrated? They would say, it's not to do with the prefrontal cortex, nothing that guy Charlie in the rainbow t-shirt's talking about. It's simply to do with this. You have seven times the power of mind. Any spiritual practice you do in the lucid dream, 700% more effective. Any healing you do, 700% more effective. Now, someone asked recently, how did they work out the 700% thing? OK, this is where you need some kind of Tibetan uh, awareness of Tibetan culture. Seven times means like a fuckload. <laughs> so like, it, let's say I fall in love with a Tibetan woman, and I say, do you love me? She might say seven times. It means like a fuckload, right? So don't worry about the exact 700%. It just means I love you loads. OK, so let's start on these case studies. I want to prove to you that anybody can do this. These are not special. Well, they are. We're all special. But there is nothing more special than any of these people than any of you. You all have Buddha nature. They all have Buddha nature. We're all divine beings dreaming ourselves into existence. This one happens to be called Matt. So Matt emailed me about a year ago. His email was titled, I Cured Depression Through Lucid Dreaming. I get a lot of emails. But if you write that in the title line, I'm answering back quickly. So Matt's story, he had clinical depression for 15 years. He had what's called treatment-resistant depression. That means he had tried multiple medications. He had had multiple forms of therapy, including cognitive behavioral therapy, um, counseling, and straight-up one-on-one Western psychotherapy of the analytical sort. Nothing was touching the sides. Nothing was touching the sides. He had been depressed for 15 years. He then discovered lucid dreaming. He became pretty good at lucid dreaming. Within the first couple of months, he had uh, five or six lucid dreams. He had read in my books that I say, always make sure you have a dream plan, a really good reason to have a lucid dream. He had decided his reason was to integrate his depression. Soon after that, he became lucid. He's in a dream. He notices something was weird. He was like, wait, I don't live in this place anymore. Boom, became lucid. Oh, what did I want to do? I wanted to work with my depression. Now, interestingly, because he was depressed, he said even in the lucid dream he was depressed. So he kind of sarcastically said to the dream, go on then, what made me depressed? Like that. Go on then, what made me depressed? Boom! Suddenly the dream changes. He's on a brick path leading to a beach, and there is a cove behind the beach. He walks down the brick path. He's onto the beach. He moves round to the cove, and he sees his grandma, who died when he was 10 years old. She's shaking and confused from the Alzheimer's that killed her. When he looks at his grandma, suddenly a voice in the dream tells him, the root of your depression is the death of your grandmother. You are not allowed to cry and you feel guilt and shame around her death. The dream directly told him this. He then had a moment to kind of sink in and go, fuck, 
This is right, I wasn't allowed to cry. I was told to not be upset and I felt guilty that I never went to visit her in hospital. It was too scary to see her in that state when I was 10 years old. When the penny drop dropped for him, and he had that moment of, yes, it's true, because the lucid dream is like a biofeedback mechanism, his grandmother changed, and she suddenly became healthy again and smiled at him. He walked up to her and hugged her, as I always say, hug everything in your lucid dreams. <laughs> hug everything. If the lucid dream is a symbolic, imaginal realm, what could be more symbolic of integration than the hug? So he goes up to her and he hugs her. And he said, Charlie, it was like a hug I had never hugged before. The energy was so profound, it woke me up. So he hugs her, boom, and then he wakes up in real life. And he said, from that day forward, there was no depression. He weaned himself off his medication. He stopped going to therapy. And because in one of my books, I said, um, if you have a lucid dream healing, don't jump to conclusions. Give it, a few, give it some time before you assess whether the healings really occurred. He left it two years. <laughs> he emailed me two years later to say this. Two years and still no depression, no medication. That lucid dream did what no therapy or medication could do. I spoke to him just recently, actually, to ask if I could use his uh, picture in this talk. And he said, yes, he is still free of depression. So that's been about three years now. Uh, and he was a bit annoyed that he hasn't had many lucid dreams recently, but he hoped that this talk would send him the energy to have more. So we'll send Matt some energy. <laughs> Here's the original email. I know that if you make extraordinary claims, it requires extraordinary evidence. So here is the original email from Matt. And like I said, if you title an email like that, you're going to get a reply back from me pretty soon.